So today I'm going to talk about two books that have both uh, won literary prizes this year. The first is Naomi Alderman's The Power, which won the Bailey's Prize. And the second is A Horse Walks Into a Bar by David Grossman, which won the Penn International Prize. Uh, now I'm not using them particularly to say anything about prizes and competitions because um, I don't know, I haven't read any of the other books that are on the shortlist, so I don't know what they were up against. So no idea if they were deserving or not. Um, but I suppose it shows to the power of uh, prizes that that's why I happened to have read both of them. The Alderman, because it was the selection of my book club, possibly on the back of uh, all the press and media for winning the prize. And the Grossman, uh, I had read a previous book by David Grossman called Be My Knife, which I really didn't like at all. Um, but this intrigued me. And the only reason I became aware of it and its subject matter was because it won its prize and garnered media. So I think that is the the best thing to say about these prizes is not about the merit of the winners and, and all of that but it gets people talking about books which is obviously a good thing uh, it gets a lot of media coverage and it's a marketing opportunity for the publishers to get more sales so uh, you know prizes I'm absolutely uh, neutral about really uh, the last time I was sort of involved with uh, a prize in terms of being sort of very focused on it was the year that um Howard Jacobson won the uh, Booker Prize um, because there were three titles on that shortlist which I read which I thought was you know so interesting so so sort of vital to read one was Tom McCarthy's C one was Emma Donoghue's Room and the third was Damon Galgut's uh, book and there were three of the five or six on the on the shortlist and any of them would have been a worthy winner and yet they gave it to Howard Jacobson uh, whose book was the same as all his other books I feel um, but it was it seemed to me to be a reward for uh you know a constant quality uh, body of work rather than that particular title and i think since since my sort of disillusion with that i've never really got involved with prizes but anyway let's uh, get on to the two books themselves which is what i'm here to talk about so after that first ever edit on uh, tone raider it's time to turn to uh the power by Naomi alton alderman sorry um now i've heard the author herself describe this as feminist sci-fi which immediately uh, pricks my interest because uh, I've written a feminist sci-fi a few years ago. I'm not going to talk about mine, don't worry. Um, and the premise of this is fascinating. It is that women now have power over men. And that power is that in their sort of collarbone, there's what's called a skein from which women uh, have an electrical charge that they can shock people. And it starts with young girls uh, who sort of come to it naturally and then gradually all women realise that with a bit of practice they can they can unleash this. So uh, it's a bit like the sort of um, Star Trek phases you can set to stun or kill or the range in between. So suddenly the tables are turned on men that women you know have much greater power than men and what does that do for society and this is where it gets a bit odd for me because it seems a very strange kind of feminism, because what the characters here end up doing is one is a cult leader, uh, a religious cult leader. One is already born into a, uh, a gangster's family, although as the girl, she probably wouldn't have been included in it. But here she uh, demonstrates her own ambitions to widen the family's uh, criminal uh, organisation, particularly with uh, drug dealing, a drug that's sort of uh, related to the power and enhancing the power. A third is a politician, very ambitious, who not only uses uh, sort of political machinations to rise up to a very high level of uh, state in, in the US, but on the side, she's sort of privateering. She starts a private army of, of sort of training girls in, in this power, but it's very much her private army. So she's sort of venal and corrupt. So, you, and then there's a, another wife of um, a president who basically sort of bumps him off and takes over um the, the country so what's odd is that when given the power that men currently seem to have or have acquired in our society women act exactly the same in in like really sort of you know disappointing ways uh you know they do exactly the same as men do now there's stories of of sort of revenge rapes on men there's children who are killed for no reason other than sort of you know sadism um and that seems to me to let men off the hook if 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 that's if if this is supposed to be a feminist uh, uh sort of slant in that given the same power as men 
or given or or with the tables turned so that women are, have more power than men they behave just as badly as men and i don't really understand that that sort of line of argument and also it reduces the book's sort of main theme to well power corrupts you know when you give power to people this is how they behave um and it's ironic that in a way the most sympathetic character and the characters are really not very well drawn in this at all but the most sympathetic character it's a male journalist, uh, you know, from Nigeria. He's the only one who has any sort of humanity about him at all. Um, so I find all that very, very strange uh, to try and argue this as a feminist book. Uh, and then the other uh, sort of major problem I had with it was its sort of geopolitics. Um, now, I understand entirely why the author selected Moldova and Saudi Arabia to be sort of the two you know, revolutionary sites where women sort of, you know, rise up and throw off their shackles. Saudi Arabia, obviously, because, you know, women are very much second class citizens there. They literally throw off their hijabs and uh, they take over the country and they, they depose the king. And Moldova, because it's the sort of the hub of, of, of the sex traffic trade of, of Eastern European women into the, into the sex trade in the West. So again, I, intellectually, you can see exactly why they, she's chosen those two countries to be the uprising. But equally, if you think in terms of sort of oppression of, of women, you could have gone for India, which has a sort of massive rape culture at the moment, uh, or China, which historically, of course, has had the foot binding of breaking ankles to keep the foot small of women. And then more recently had the ban on, on uh, more than one child families, which tended to mean that, you know, male babies were favoured over female. And you probably got that thing that you had in ancient Sparta where they would, you know, throw girl babies off a cliff to kill them, you know, just just to sort of, you know, boost the, the, the male side of, the, of their population. But no, nothing happens in those two countries, you know, possibly because, you know, the populations are too big or, or whatever. But that returns us to Saudi and Moldova as the hub of the book. And really, it's the deposed king of Saudi basically wants to get his country back. So he decides to wage a practice war to, you know, how can he deal with this sort of new weapon that women have uh, in Moldova? So Moldova's revolution has meant that one half of the country has become a women's republic, but the other half is where the Saudi king is paying lots of money and resources in, and there's a war going on between them. So the whole battle for the sort of soul of, of mankind is happening in Moldova, which strikes me as odd, really. It's too, it's too small and ins insignificant to carry the weight of... of of this global phenomenon. I think you would have uprisings and battles elsewhere. Um, and also why the Saudi king is getting involved in Moldova, where there's no sort of Islamic um, link at all. It, I, I just don't buy it. Um, you know, sort of the history of revolution teaches us that revolutions often occur in the most surprising places. You know, Marx very confidently predicted that the, you know, the first communist revolution would be in industrialized Germany or Britain because his model was very much based on a sort of an urban working class becoming the revolutionary uh, force. Whereas, of course, the, the two nominal uh, communist uh, revolutions were in agricultural China and Russia, which had a very uh, undeveloped in industrial base as well. So I just think her political analysis is wrong. Um, and just going back to the notion of, of, of characters in the book, such as they are, uh, the cult leader, who's the main sort of glue that sort of holds it. She's sort of the first to discover the power and 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 sort of uh, is frightened by it and, and things like that. Um, she hears this. She's called Mother Eve or she renames herself Mother Eve. And she's she's um, hears this voice constantly. It seems to be an angel talking in her ear or a goddess possibly, who she's always sort of advise it, you know, trying to get advice off and, you know, am I doing the right thing? And very quickly I realised that, no, she's schizophrenic. This is a schizophrenic voice she's hearing. Um, and the reason she's, she's sort of schizophrenic is because she has suffered sexual abuse at the hands of her stepfather. And that's enough to, you know, obviously break a psyche and, you know, she's developed schizophrenia. And you can see that. But the really disturbing thing is stepfather is only abusing her at the request of the stepmother because the stepmother sees that sexual abuse as a way to control this sort of un unruly wild kid who they've adopted it's not their birth child so what you're actually having is is yeah the man is doing the physical act of, of rape 
but a woman is, is instituting it. And again, you know, this notion of sort of feminism, it just utterly bizarre to me. Um, so I just, I did not understand. I mean, I know I said I would talk about prizes and I don't know what else it was up against, but I did not understand how this book won the prize because I think it's a poor book. It's a brilliant premise, doesn't execute it. The characters are paper thin. It has a very strange line of argument. Um, the one thing I did like about it is what she does with time, which is a bit similar to um, what Martel did in uh, The Life of Pi, where she turns the whole book on its on its head or, or one one understanding of the book on its head because the book is framed by uh, initially there's two letters exchanged by a right male writer and a female editor and then at the end there's a um, an exchange of letters and basically the man is sort of talking about you know um, you know is this fiction or is it history and what you realize is that the scenario that's described in the book which we you know we would recognize as just beyond our future um you know our sort of 21st century and uh, you know just beyond that in the book is shown to be actually no that happened 5,000 years ago so our near future is their very very ancient past and there's sort of illustrations in the book of sort of you know uh, religious and otherwise artifacts relating to the power of women as like little statuettes with their sort of skin and things like that um, now I think that is interesting and I, and I you know I, I applaud that but it's the only real sort of saving grace of this book whatsoever. Um, so I was really, really disappointed in this. It almost read to me like a young adult book. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if it is or it isn't, but to me that's how it read. It's not a very sophisticated read, although the ideas contained within it potentially are very sophisticated. Okay, so that was that. So uh, now onto the Grossman, uh, A Horse Walks Into a Bar. So what this book is, is a Israeli stand-up comedian in his 50s who's sort of been ravaged by cancer and is, you know, is completely sort of wrung out sort of physically. He's doing a gig in Atanya, which is an Israeli sort of town, uh, and it's going to be his last ever gig. And he has invited an old school friend who he hasn't seen for 40 years um, to come... Uh, and watch him he didn't invite him he actually you know completely begs and hounds him to get him along and he's asked him to you know give his verdict uh and you think he give his verdict on the act but what he actually wants because this guy is a retired judge so what the comedian actually wants is uh judgment on his life has he you know has he lived a good life has he behaved morally and he wants in a way he wants forgiveness uh because of the great reveal at the end of the at the end of the book which i won't spoil uh when i say great i mean that's how it's built up not necessarily that i feel it's great but we'll come to that now what's remarkable about this book is that the way it's written it's sort of in real as you're reading it's sort of in real time in the sense of you the reader are very much in the audience in that it starts off with some good jokes and then you realize it's a confessional um and every time the comedian reports that, oh, I'm losing the audience, or I've gone too far, that's in bad taste, or, oh, you want some more jokes, you want me to stop with this, or less of this, and back to the joke. That's exactly how you, the reader, feels. And uh, that's really interesting and quite, quite sort of uh, different as a read, in that you're being talked to directly but it's as if you're in the room watching the comedians. It's quite impre an impressive feat, I feel. Um, towards the end, uh, some of the people start walking out and you, the reader, also unfortunately feel like, mm, should I stick with the book uh, or should I stop reading? Which is effectively would be you walking out. Um, because the confessional takes over and you too sometimes think, oh no, get back to the jokes, uh, you know. Um, so that's a really interesting dynamic. But the problem with the book is, that the great reveal that it's all been building up to is not that um, it's not that involving really it's it's you know something happened to him as a child or as a teenager and that's what the whole thing's been building up to and it's a bit of a letdown it's it's not very I don't think it's very significant this great dilemma didn't turn out to be that great um, and the book is called A Horse Walks Into a Bar and that joke 
is not original to him. It's been told to him by someone who was driving him back from an army youth camp that he was uh, he was in training. Um, and the joke is never completed. And in a way you feel, does that mean this whole book is a shaggy dog story? Which is obviously one form of, of stand-up comedy where you sort of, you know, you sort of build up this elaborate sort of, you know, act that actually leads nowhere at the end. And that's kind of the joke and the payoff. And I wondered if that was the point of this, that, but no, it seems so specific. And he kept, you know, towards the end, it kept really sort of focusing and just delaying and delaying and delaying what the exact sort of moral crux of this was. Um, so I don't think it, is, it was meant as a shaggy dog story. I think it's presented as this is the terrible act that happened to him. We, the reader, the judge in the audience, he's asking us to judge him. And I just didn't think it was worthy of judgment. And by the time I'd finished, by the time, you know, although I admired how I, the reader, was literally, not literally, was sort of almost, you know, put in, in a real audience to this act, which obviously never really happened. So I th thought that was admirable. But I also feel that a lot of what it was talking about in terms of that fragile, vulnerable persona that goes up on stage, you know, creates this persona of the guy that he's talking about now. It, Obviously, it's the comedian, but also it's not because it's an act. It's a projection. So how much of the confessional is genuinely confessional? Now, all of that stuff pertains to a certain type of stand-up comedy, which Stuart Lee uh, analyses in his books on stand-up comedy, because that's what he does. He, Stuart Lee, creates a character called Stuart Lee, who is a stand-up comedian who goes up on stage and gets very irritated with his audience because they don't feel the same level of passions and political angst and all this sort of stuff as he does and the interesting thing is always this tension between how much is this the real Stuart Lee and how much is this the character and there's a lot of that in here but because I've read the Stuart Lee books and his analysis of, of how that works and how to make it work and exactly what you're doing to the audience and how and why in a way that's you know I've read all that so to read it again in here it's not as fresh for me as I think it would be for for people approaching this, you know, with no sort of preconceptions about how this type of stand-up comedy works and, 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 and things. So, ultimately, I didn't get as much out of this book as I, as I thought I might. Uh, it starts off really well. It's funny. There's lots of jokes. Then you are immersed in it as if you were a member of this audience, which I think is a, is a you know, it's definitely worth undergoing that experience because it is odd as a reader, you know, to be sort of experiencing something in real time as you're reading it. Um, I think that's great. But by about halfway, it's got nothing more to build on that because then it just becomes concerned with the confessional side, which, as I say, ultimately doesn't really carry the weight of being all that interesting. So... Those are the, the two books for this week, um, both prize winners. Uh, both, I have to say, disappointing. Now, as I say, I don't need to reflect that on the prizes because I don't know what they're up against. But it just so happens that I've read these two books that made waves this year and neither of them really did it for me. Um, having said that, I've since read Paul Beatty's book, The Sellout, which won the Man Booker Prize last year, and that was great. So it's not the thing about, oh, prizes always give it to the most mediocre work because that's, you know, the judges come to compromise. I'm not saying that at all because the Paul Beatty book is great. So um, that's it for now. Till next week.